It's 37 degrees. I hope though we can keep the informality and make it a Bible class arrangement and approach rather than a sermon, because our purpose in having this series is to really, after all day of preaching, to have at least one panel discussion each day and also a Bible class at the end, and we will watch our time very carefully and honor the time limit. We want to be sure and do that. Turn to Matthew chapter 5, please. May I ask some brother to go close these doors over here, too? It really would help. I'd appreciate it. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to study four different contexts, the Lord willing, tonight, on everyday Christianity. We need to appreciate that Christianity is not primarily a church house religion. If it were, there would be a lot more mention of church buildings in the New Testament. And there's really not any mention per se. Those who center their religion around a building, a pulpit, and a preacher do greatly err. We're going to study Matthew 5 tonight, a little bit of Colossians 3, some of 1 Thessalonians 5, and if we have time, a little of Romans 12. But listen very carefully. Tomorrow night, the book of James, the book above all books that speaks of everyday Christian living, living for Christ every day. And then the next night, 1 Peter, which rivals the five chapters of James as being most practical. And then last, the book of 2 Peter. So tomorrow night, James, the next night, 1 Peter, the next night, the last night, 2 Peter. So you can be reading and studying ahead for the practical emphasis of everyday religion. In Acts 5.42, we read of the early church daily in the temple and from house to house. They cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Acts 17.11 says they search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me, Luke 9, 23. And in Acts 6, we read that the church in Jerusalem was engaged in daily benevolence. If there's anything for sure about Christianity, it is it applies to every action of every day in the life of the devotee, the servant, the disciple, the free, willing, bond slave of Jesus. And when we activate that faith, as was preached tonight by Brother Maxey in an excellent lesson, a challenging one, an embracive, comprehensive one, then it will be not only an everyday religion, but every minute of every hour of every day. God gives us 168 hours a week. We all have the same number. Isn't that strange? Some people say, I never have time. And it is true that if you want to get something done, ask the busy fellow. He'll find time to serve the Lord again. But we all have the same amount of time, and it's how we utilize it that could very well spell the difference in heaven and hell, our eternal destiny. But let's notice just briefly <coughs> excerpts from the first 16 verses of Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, the basic fundamental guidelines of New Testament Christianity. This is the Magna Carta of the religion of the Son of God, and he himself, the master teacher, gave it. And since he knew what was in man, John 2.25, and never a man so spake as he, John 7.46, and he was truly a teacher sent by God, John 3, verse 2. We have here the manifesto of the mandate of heaven for the servants of Jesus. Notice the qualities, the attitudes, the attributes, the traits of the child of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. They acknowledge that they're poverty-stricken and thus need the absolute help of a righteous God to supply the things they need to serve him daily. I read just today that uh, in Detroit, a thief came upon a house, and with bold letters, the one who lived there said, this house is protected by poverty. There's nothing in here you'd want to steal. I've often said a thief that'd come into my house would probably leave me a uh, get-well note and a $5 bill, a sympathy card. But now that ought to be applied to the way we look on our righteousness. If it were not for the Lord, we'd be without value and without hope. We must confess that we're poor in spirit, that spiritually we cannot save ourselves by ourselves, that that emanates from heaven, the source of redemption is God, that we cannot earn heaven, we will never be able to fully repay the debt we owe, and that spurs us on. It doesn't discourage us, it spurs us on to do the best we can under the righteous banner of a loving God. So the word blessed absolutely means happy. 
And here are some of the paradoxes of the Bible, truth standing on its head to gain attention. How can you be happy if you're poor? How can you be happy if you're mourned? How can you be happy if you're persecuted? That's the unique thing about Christianity. It's truth standing on its head to gain attention. You have a different set of values. You look at life completely differently. And so we are happy when we're poor, poor in spirit, because then we go to the source of riches, of strength, of power, of grandeur, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul said unto me, who am the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. When I think of Paul, I don't think of someone poor in spirit, do you? But that's what he said of himself. And that's why the Lord used him so mightily. Never braggadocio, never self-exalted, never ego-centered. He submerged his identity into that of Christ, lost himself in the service of Jesus, and because he was poor in spirit, he became rich in the results of serving the Lord. That's practical, everyday application in our lives. And the older I get, and the more I study the Bible, and the more I observe human nature, the more I am convinced that attitude is the key word in Christianity. And if we don't get that right, anything that follows will never, ever be right. Really, the beatitudes are the proper attitudes of happy servants of God. And if you find a person who claims to be a member of the church, and sometimes they say, I was raised in the church, been a member of the church all my life, but they're grouchy, they're arrogant, they're short-fused, they are, as Paul said in Romans 1, implacable, impossible to please. They've never bowed in submission in the attitude area of life. In that arena, they're very deficient. Whatever else may be said about them, their attitude needs to be changed. And so the attitude of gratitude is a practical exhortation for children of God, if they would be happy. And then he says, blessed are those who mourn. Happy are those who weep, if they weep over the right things. And Isaiah 520, we read of some who had their valuation system upside down. They laughed at the wrong things and cried at the wrong things and made truth error and error truth and light darkness and darkness light. And they were without value in the kingdom of God and the service of the king. We need to mourn for the right things. Weep with those that weep, rejoice with those that do rejoice, Romans 12, 15. Jesus, the only perfect one who ever lived, wept over a city that couldn't care less. Abraham, the most righteous man of his day, wept over Sodom and Gomorrah, the wicked people there, had nothing to weep about, they thought. Jeremiah, the most virtuous, righteous person in all of Judah, wept. His tears flowed down his fountains and rivers of water. Jeremiah 9, 1 to 3. And yet he was righteous and lamented over them. And to them he said, is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Lamentation 1, 12. So it makes a difference what we mourn over. I wrote an article once on what made Jesus weep. And then as I studied the book of Lamentations, I realized that in the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament, the one that Christ and the apostles quoted 85 to 90% of the time, Lamentations is not in there. In the place of that word, that book is called the Tears of Jeremiah. And Lamentation is a five-chapter funeral dirge that he gave out over a city that was careless and indifferent and yet it broke his heart. Instead of saying, I told you so, he could have said that. He wept over their indifference. That produced seven decades of bondage. Blessed are those who mourn. The great heroes of the Bible are those who shed the right kind of tears, who wept over the proper things. I've said it before, but I think it's an apt illustration. I've known of people, members of the church, who'd stay up till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning watching some late, late, late show, and they'd sit there and shed tears over Lassie who didn't come home or an old horse who got run over by a train on the way to winning the Kentucky Derby, and they come to the Lord's Supper the next morning won't even bow their head, much less shed a tear. See, unless we mourn over the right things, we're not blessed. That's practical. Blessed are the meek, and that's a sheepfold term that means... A sheep does not run before a shepherd. He submits to the leadership of the shepherd that's been appointed to guide him. And Jesus is a good shepherd. He said he was, John chapter 10. And he leads us even through the valley of the shadow of death, Psalm 23, 4. The meek are those who say, Lord, what will you have me to do? Acts 9, 6. Instead of telling the Lord what they're going to do and, and almost saying, and you better like what I do because that's what I'm going to do anyway. And I demand my rights. 
But one brother said, Jesus died for our wrongs. Blessed are the meek, a characteristic of everyday Christianity. And Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, said so. And then he said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Best commentary I've ever read on that is Psalm 42, verse 1 and 2. As the wild animal pants after the water brooks, so longeth my soul after thee, O God. Have you ever been real, real thirsty? I guess my favorite meat is ham. I like it, but I drink about a half a gallon of water before we get in bed that night. We need to hunger and thirst after the Word of God. We need to have an insatiable appetite for the Scriptures. But some people get filled up pretty quick. In fact, some people, the minute they sit down to read the Bible, they'll sleep. But they don't do that reading the sports page or the entertainment page. So, blessed are those who do hunger and thirst after righteousness. People who want the preacher to hurry up and get through so they can be first in line at the cafeteria and beat the Methodists and Baptists there on Sunday at noon don't hunger and thirst after righteousness. They're in such a hurry they can't even wait to greet the new brother or sister in Christ who's just been baptized. Do we hunger and thirst after righteousness? These are characteristic qualities, traits, attributes, attitudes that belong to the everyday Christian, if indeed he would really be a Christian. You hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's the only thing that will fill your appetite. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And I believe the best description of that is an illustration from the parables of Jesus of the man who was mercifully forgiven of $17,425,000 and then went out and choked a lesser servant that owed him $18. Read Matthew 18. We beg for the mercy of God, forgive us, but the Bible says, as we forgive those who trespass against us. How can we expect God to automatically forgive us when we are so unrelenting and grudge-bearing that we're not about to forgive somebody, even if they crawl to us on their knees. Blessed are the merciful. I know you students are saying, I wish the teachers in the school remembered that. <laughs> Blessed are the merciful. And then in the next, Blessed are the pure in heart. I'm preaching on that tomorrow night, so I'll save you about three minutes there. But pure in heart, you can't be pure in heart if you think on impure things. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, Matthew 12. And unless we think on things that are pure, we can't possibly act in a pure way. Our life will be guided by impurity, immorality, lust, evil concupiscence, unbridled passion, wantonness. And so we must be pure in heart if we'd see God. Women who claim to be Christians need to dress in such a way as to not elicit impure thoughts by men. Men who are pure at heart might even suggest to a woman like that who claims to be a Christian that she dress more modestly. Somebody needs to. First Timothy 2 says the godly woman dresses with shamefastness, and that means the modest heart that would prohibit immodest dress. You couldn't get a woman who was shamefast to be immodest if you paid her to be. It's foreign to our nature. We read of the sin of David with Bathsheba, but how about the sin of Bathsheba with David? It takes two to tango. And they probably didn't even have that dance then. But anyway, that's a good point. And that woke two or three of you up. And you'll say, Brother Ramsey believes in dancing. But anyway, blessed are the peacemakers. And that's not P-I-E-C-E -E, like a piece of pie. It's peace like the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6. He made peace through the blood of his cross, Colossians 1, 20. We have the gospel of peace, Romans 10, 15, and that gives us peace passing understanding, Philippians 4, 7. But in the Bible, peace doesn't mean the absence of turmoil. It means the tranquility to bear up under adverse circumstances. We have peace in spite of the turmoil in the world. In the last few weeks, I've run into some of my brethren, and we all ought to be concerned. We may not be as concerned about all the proper things that we should about the Mideast crisis. We probably would be concerned about people on both sides who are so greedy for oil and money and position and territory. 
But we need to understand the fact that there's no reason for the Christians on earth, wherever they live, to be filled with consternation regardless of what externally happens in the world. The Christians who read this first and who read Romans 12 and 1 Timothy 2 about a peaceful and tranquil life and all godliness were told to pray for the rulers who persecuted them, imprisoned them, and would kill them. They have peace in the midst of an unpeaceful world. That's why it's peace passing understanding. And we need to be peacemakers and not troublemakers. Never cease to be amazed at folk who claim to be Christians that spend a lot of their time causing strife among brothers in the Lord. There are five billion people in the world and just a barely little percentage about like that of New Testament Christians on earth. And we got some folk that spend all their time stirring up the few Christians that are on earth among themselves. Paul says, you bite and devour one another, you'll be consumed one of another. Galatians 5.15 Peacemakers are a rare breed. I tried to make peace with a couple of dogs I had one time. I always liked dogs. Little dogs and little children like me real well, so adults have trouble with. But uh, I tried to make peace. I put some food down between two of these dogs. They were my dogs. I love those dogs. They act like they love me, but they love that food more than they love me. And they were about to tear each other up, so I reached in there to pull it back, and they, one bit me here and one bit me there. And I've got scars that almost meet right there. I'm not making that up. I tried to go to a ball game that night, and there's so much blood I, I couldn't get there. And my dear friends that I was trying to make peace with won the war, and they won. We're going to be like a bunch of dogs, or are we going to be peacemakers? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. We have a question box out here in the foyer you know, on Wednesday nights for several months. We've answered the questions people have written. Dave and I, in one of our discussion programs on the TV, uh, were discussing the Beatitudes, and when we came to this, I'd already made the point that the word blessed does mean happy, and you could translate it happy and be consistent with everything the Bible says. And this questioner said, how in the world could you be so ridiculous as to say a person is happy when they're persecuted? And I said, well, that's what the Lord said. Why? He has a different view of what counts. He'd rather... He'd be more happy to be persecuted for righteousness' sake than to be left alone for error or timidity or cowardice. I've often said if I ever go to prison, I hope it's because I preach the gospel and live the Christian life. I believe I could bear that. I believe I could handle that. That'd be the only reason I'd ever want to go to prison. And so you're happy when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. And in 1 Peter chapters 3 and 4, he said, But you better be sure when you're persecuted it's because you're a Christian and not a busybody and a meddler in other men's matters. He said, What good is it if you're persecuted when you ought to be persecuted? So the happy attitude of the Christian is, If persecution comes because I'm a Christian, I will gladly bear these things. Paul said, I stand in jeopardy every hour. The sentence of death is always upon me. I die daily. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We ought to be happy then if we suffer persecution because we're righteous. That means we're getting nearer to Jesus. So it is happy. As a gospel preacher, I've been opposed. I've come close to being persecuted. Some people say I preach too bluntly. Can't believe that, as nice a guy as I am. But you know, I, if I am a faithful gospel preacher, I should expect opposition and tribulation. Was Paul a faithful preacher was Jesus. They hanged him between thieves and he's a perfect preacher. So it was a happy circumstance that drove him to the cross because it meant he had done the Father's will. He said, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Some of us have lived to see that come to pass. And all of a sudden the Bible becomes more real and not a piece of journalism that dropped out of the sky a long time ago far, far away for somebody's consumption. You want to be happy? Jesus said, here's the way to be every day, not every once in a while. <laughs> and then he concludes by saying, if you will put these attributes into your life, you'll be the salt of the earth. The saving, preserving, flavoring influence of the world. And you'll make people hunger and thirst after righteousness. Salt makes people thirsty. You'll make sinners sting. Salt stings. And truth stings error. That's why Christians ought to expect for the world to be stung by what we stand for. And if the world doesn't even notice us, we must not be turning the world upside down for Christ, as the early Christians did in Acts 17, verse 6. 
We're going to have to reorient our thinking on what the Christian life is all about. It's backward reasoning, upside down logic to the world. But Jesus said it. And then he said, you're not only the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. And men don't take the light and put it under a bushel but on a stand. And it gives light to all those who are in the house. Now let's turn to 1 Thessalonians 5. I knew just surely as Maxie spoke before I did, he'd steal Colossians 3. But fortunately, he didn't get everything in there. There are a few more verses. But let's go first to 1 Thessalonians 5 <laughs> for rules for Christian living. You talk about practical, everyday Christianity that's within the grasp of every one of us. Here it is. We'd like to begin back with verse 12, but let's begin with verse 14. The other two verses simply tell us to esteem highly in love for their work's sake, those that have oversight over us in the work of the Lord, and that we should certainly do. We should pray for the elders of the church. We should submit to their leadership in realms of judgment. We should ever be the kind of member that aids and abets their cause, the cause of Christ, and not those who hinder and thwart and hurt. But then beginning in verse 14, Practical rules for everyday Christianity. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Now that's a lifetime right there. About a year and a half later, he wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, in essence he said, you remember I told you to warn those that were disorderly? Now I'm going to tell you, withdraw from them. They've had time to repent. They know better. They've been informed. Now withdraw from them. Practical, just not done very often. It takes courage. It takes more courage to be a faithful Christian than anything else in the world. Christianity is not a game for sissies and cowards. It takes more stalwart dedication to be a faithful Christian than anything else in the world. Comfort the feeble-minded. I've been wondering why so many of you have been coming around trying to comfort me. <laughs> Support the weak. Someone said it would take two of me to make a half wit. I don't understand that. My mother was glad I wasn't twins, so. though. Uh, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. Romans 12 will say, if your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. Don't render evil for evil. First Peter 2 says, when Jesus was reviled, he reviled not again. When he was threatened, he threatened not. And he's our example. Paul said, be ye imitators of me, even as I am of Christ. First Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11.1. But we retaliate. We can't wait to get in that last digging word to our critic. Have you ever been strong enough just for one day with people who are critical of you just to stand there and smile and then say, now, is there anything else? I'm sure I needed that. And I appreciate you loving me so much that you would come and knock my knees off of me. But uh, we do really need to be more like Jesus. But ever follow that which is good. And that doesn't mean the way we define good. Talk about how God defends it. Both among yourselves and to all men. Now notice how one verse after another, in great rapidity, in concerted action, calls to attention the child of God in daily living. Rejoice evermore. Again, we need to count our blessings instead of list our complaints. Rejoice evermore. Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And he was in prison under wicked Nero Caesar when he said that. Philippians 4 4. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. That means to always have an attitude of prayer, be inclined toward prayer, never engage in anything where prayer would be out of place. Let your life be characterized with prayerfulness. As Brother L.O. Sanderson wrote in the great gospel song, pray in the morning, pray in the noontide, pray in the evening, pray any time, pray when you're happy, pray when in sorrow, pray when you're tempted, pray all the time. But the Bible that tells us to pray without ceasing tells us to study our Bibles too and tells us if we'll not work, neither let us eat. And so we can't occupy jobs every day with our eyes shut all the time. I wouldn't want people to drive with their eyes closed. It means have a prayerful disposition. It might also mean you might could pray with your eyes open. A lot of people, when they go to a boarding house and have about 30 people wanting those seven pieces of chicken, they lead to prayer with their eyes wide open and their fork ready to attack. But it doesn't mean that we'd always have a prayerful disposition. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5, 16. This is the confidence we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. 
1 John 5, 14. Men ought always to pray and never to faint. Luke 18, 1. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Philippians 2 says we're not to murmur or complain. And we're to do what we do in the realm of hospitality with sincere honesty. And not complaining about it. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. If you've ever heard little children pray and they enumerate everything they can think of and thank God for it. That childlike trusting faith and genuine gratitude overwhelms you and makes you ashamed of how we have to have a lot before we're grateful at all. I never shall forget the first time I preached in Africa, out in the bush country of Africa. Their main highways looked like a cow path in Texas or Oklahoma. But you get out in the outback region and you're really out in the willies, in the boondocks. I preached out there in the open air to 276 people, the same numbers on board that ship in Acts 27. Village chiefs were there, so people walked 40 miles barefooted to hear the gospel preached. Afterwards, some of the brethren invited us to their very deep poverty. If they had any kind of house at all other than a mud hut with a thatched roof, it might be a shingle up chicken cup with a tin roof on it. Never saw such hospitality. They said, eat with us. I was beginning to look over the situation. And uh, they said, we have mealy. That means little balls of cornmeal rounded up like that. And down on the porch on the floor was the dirtiest basin you ever saw filled with chicken grease and innards. And it rolled that thing up like that. I'm not exaggerating. It rolled up like that, threw it up in there. And man, they could catch that burn anybody ever caught popcorn. And they said, would you eat with us? And I said, well, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. Incidentally, it didn't take much to make those people happy. And everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. Now that's interesting. The references in the Bible forever prove the Holy Spirit is not an it, but a he. Vex not the Holy Spirit, Isaiah 63.10. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, quench not the Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Don't cause the message of the Spirit to dry up and to be useless in your midst because you rebelled against it. The Holy Spirit guided the apostles into all truth, John 16.13, and God's Word is truth, John 17.17, 17, and the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, Ephesians 6.17, so the best way to quench the Spirit is to turn a deaf ear to His teachings through the Word. And there's still people who quench the Spirit. They don't care what the Bible says. They want to protect their own traditions. Mark 7, verse 9. And the Bible, the contrary, notwithstanding. I've never checked that out. The Bible, the contrary, notwithstanding. But it sounds good. I, that may be a triple negative. I don't know, but it's bad. And then 20, despise not prophesies. According to 1 Corinthians 14, when an inspired prophet, while prophecy was still one of the nine miraculous gifts, the prophet would stand up in an assembly and speak for God, and some people wouldn't pay attention to it. It's like, brethren, today when the Bible is read, the message of God is read. There are those who have a disdain for it. They may not stand up and oppose it openly, but they won't put it into practice. And out on the parking lot, they'll talk against the teacher or preacher who taught it. That is despising Bible teaching. But verse 21 is probably the most important point of all. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Well, how are we going to do that? has to be a standard by which we judge what's good. Let me make this affirmation. I want you to listen to it carefully. We live in an age when even brethren have borrowed denominational doctrine, and when you press the Bible on them, they'll say, don't be judgmental. Judge not you be not judged, Matthew 7, 1 to 3. And that is in the Bible. We need to understand what it's saying. But how about John 7, 24, where Jesus said, judge righteous judgment. I'm commanded to judge in John 7, 24. And Jesus said the word he spoke, the same with judges, John 12, 48. So we give a thus saith the Lord to oppose a certain thing or to affirm a certain thing. That's not judgmental, that's Bible. And we need to stand by it till the cows come home. We need to appreciate the only way we can prove all things and hold fast that which is good is to know the message of the scripture. Tonight, Maxie said over and over and over again, thus saith the Lord. He'd quote a passage and say, thus saith the Lord. That's the kind of preaching we need. 
We need to back up what we say, think, and believe with the scriptures, and not a think so, or the brotherhood said it. We are not to search the brotherhood to see if these things be so. We're to search the scriptures to see if these things be so. Acts 17 and 11. When am I supposed to quit? You've got 10, 12, 13 minutes. Oh, I thought it was going to be at 8.30. That's good. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, oh. <laughs> Abstain from... Some of you acted like I was through. I didn't understand that. But you don't reach for your songbook here because I'm going to have an invitation song. And that always bothers me that I recycle and preach another hour. So don't, don't, don't be nervous because that makes me nervous. And then that will really make you nervous. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's a lost art. You know what my brethren are doing with that today? They're saying that doesn't mean what it looks like it says. And they have about four or five different translations, and every time I let them read it and quote it, it says the same thing in different words. We've got so much worldliness in the church. Members of the church approach things like denominational people. Where does it say I can't do it? What's wrong with it? Everybody else is doing it. But the Bible says depart from iniquity. 2 Timothy 2.19 Abstain from all appearance of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 Keep thyself pure. 1 Timothy 5.22 Abstain from all appearance of evil. But we have members of the church today who first of all have heard a sermon against dancing in immodesty and so on. They wouldn't recognize it if it hugged them around the neck in the middle of the street. And we're doing very little about it. And if I live till tomorrow night to preach on the pure Christian, what does the Bible say about the pure Christian? We're liable to talk plainly about some of those things. A lot of times on Tuesday night, I'm not bashful and shy. It takes me about that long to build up a resolve. So tomorrow night, uh, hide under the bench. Abstain from all appearance of evil. You remember when the miniskirt craze came to the United States? Believe it or not, in the Assembly of the Saints, some of our sisters and their daughters decided they'd put the heathen fashion of Paris and London and New York City and Madrid right in the Assembly of the Saints. One fellow said it was short, short rolled up. That's not abstaining from all appearance of evil. Don't hear much preaching on modesty anymore. But notice the result, verse 23. Notice how comprehensive. If you'll do these things, the very God of peace will sanctify you, set you apart, make you distinctively his. You'll be his own possession. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, completely, thoroughly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's turn back to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. <laughs> One of the great passages in the Bible on everyday Christianity. Maxie may not think I listen carefully to every word he preaches in the sermon, but he was talking about uh, what one of our brethren quoted Wednesday night as his favorite passage, Proverbs 3. And I remember asking Maxie, and I remember what he said his was. Colossians 3, 1. If you've then been risen together with Christ, seek those things above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things upon the earth, for you're dead, that is, dead to sin, dead to the world, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? When Christ who is our life. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27. Till Christ be formed in you, Galatians 4.19. Have the mind of Christ in you, Philippians 2.5. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet it is not I that liveth, but Christ liveth in me. Galatians 2.20 When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. <clears throat> but before we ever get to the land of glory, and notice what we must do, verse 5, mortify. And that's where we get our word mortician. Put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Well, what are you talking about? Fornication. In the first century, fornication was as natural as breathing to the pagan, the heathen. I'm afraid it's getting that way to people in the United States of America. It is amazing to me how the news media of America makes fun of purity and integrity and sanctity and godliness and every pervert in the world is protected and bragged on and felt sorry for. And then they want those of us who believe all that's ungodly to foot the bill for their rehabilitation. We're living in a hellish, shameful, debauched world and they were in the first century too but he said in the midst of all the adversity of the Roman Empire put to death therefore your members which are upon the earth 
fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. Evil concupiscence means unbridled passion. It's that wantonness that's mentioned in Romans chapter 13. And after mentioning that, he said, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill, fulfill the lust thereof. Romans 13, 14. For which say, things sake, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when you lived in them. I've been told in the last 15 years by men who would claim to be gospel preachers that you can't live in adultery. That you may commit it once, but after that you're not living in it. Well, if it's adultery once and you keep doing whatever that was once, and you do it twice, as old country boy said, that's still the same thing it was the first time. And you can live in it. You can have a pattern of life because the Bible says they lived in it. You go to a debate with some of those fellows, though, and they'll act like that never showed up in their Bible. And they'll look for a loophole to get it out of there. But they're going to have to buy some scissors to get it out of there. You lived in these things. But notice, notice the daily Christian life. But now you also put off all these. Now here is where we separate the men and the boys in the spiritual arena. We've got a lot of folk who will lambast those external sins he just listed. But as Maxie mentioned tonight, harbor these inward sins that are just as defiling. Christianity cuts both ways, external, internal, outside, inside, saint and sinner alike. It's a two-edged sword, Hebrews 4.12. But now you also put off all these. See, these are the thoughts back of the other action. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. There are people who don't commit adultery, but have filthy communication out of their mouth. There are those who don't murder their neighbor, but they have malice and anger and wrath. I've met some folk who thought they were real good, strong Christians who came as close to cursing a brother who differed with them as you can without cursing. And sometimes they slipped and just went ahead with the real thing. But see, they didn't murder their brother. They just cut him to pieces with their tongue. Everyday Christian living involves all of this. Now it gets even deeper. He actually meddles in our life. He said, lie not one to another seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. I still love the illustration of the preacher who came out in the vestibule, as preachers are supposed to do, I guess, after he'd preached and this woman came out who was a little bit difficult to deal with, and he decided to get on her good side that day. And he said, I'll tell you, sister, you look prettier than I've ever seen you before. She said, I wish I could tell you that, preacher. And he said, you could if you're as big a liar as I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> lie not one to another. Seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now, isn't it interesting that 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But notice he's not through yet. Now, you talk about a thoroughgoing sermon on everyday Christianity, and we don't get a 100% rounded tour a lot of times. He's not through yet. It's not enough to put off these things, outward and inward. You've got to put on some outward and inward qualities in everyday Christianity. Verse 12, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. That sort of sounds like that Sermon on the Mountain of Beatitudes, doesn't it? It's not enough for you to stand on the ground of what you oppose and what you don't do. You've got to put on some things. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity. That's love in action. If anything, charity is a stronger word than love. How are you doing? Are you a Boy Scout? Good, good for you. That's what, uh, the restroom is right down this hall. Right here. <laughs> forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. See, we don't think about that. We expect the Lord to forgive us of the monumental catalog of sins we committed. And then we won't be forgiving toward others. And above all these things, put on love, charity, love in action, which is the bond of perfectness, wholeness, completeness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you're called in one body, 
and be ye thankful. But now let's skip on down and notice how daily Christian living, living is brought into our conduct in the workplace. Verse 22, servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Where would you find a greater chapter on daily Christian living? Put off, put on. External, internal. Four developed points on daily Christian living. Now we didn't get to Romans 12. But if we live another night, it'll still be in our Bibles, and we'll take Romans 12 in the book of James. By the time we get to the last night, we'll take Romans 12, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. <laughs> but you better be glad we're not covering the Apocrypha. We'll get that another time. Appreciate it very, very much. I'm Jeff Archie for the International Selected. Gospel Hour. Living room app selected. Screen recording.